I'm Alpha Tan from the University of Maryland. I'll be showing you some interesting work on the Bucharest Early Intervention Project and how early psychosocial deprivation can shape physical health later on. This is only a subset of work that I do. I also do some interesting work on temperament and brain function. So children raised in institutions or orphanages experience an extreme form of neglect and deprivation. These children don't get the normal expected care that they would receive uh, from normal families. So in institutions, the caregivers have rotating shifts. They are not psychologically invested in the children and there's no individualized care or response to their distress. So this kind of environment has been associated with negative outcomes across almost all domains of functioning, including mental health, social and brain development. But less is known about their physical health, even though other forms of early adversities like child maltreatment and social disadvantage are related to chronic illnesses in adulthood. There are a couple of reasons why it would be important to address this issue. First, neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment in the United States. So of all reports of child abuse, neglect is in 75% of them. And around the world, 8 million children are currently being raised in institutions. Here is a figure that shows the course of physical health problems linked to child adversities. It lays out the processes that might lead to poor health, including impaired social, emotional, and cognitive development, as well as health damaging behaviors. So we now know that by adolescence and early adulthood, the health risks that are that can show up include substance use, depression, obesity, and chronic low-grade inflammation. And by middle to late adulthood, then we really see the cardiometabolic syndromes and diseases that show up, which might be related to early mortality. The point of this figure is that um, is to show that we want to take a developmental perspective to account for these earlier processes so that we can inform interventions to target these processes and prevent the onset of physical illness. There are three models that can help us understand how early adversity leads to illnesses using our longitudinal data. And I have tested these three in the following studies and I will go through each in detail. But briefly, they are the biological embedding model, the stress sensitization model, and the neuroimmune network hypothesis. This is the design of our study. Um, it is the Bucharest Early Intervention Project is a randomized controlled trial of foster care versus institutional care uh, of abandoned children in Romania. So at baseline around 20 months, 187 children in the institutions were selected to be tested with a neuro and pediatric exam. And those with serious medical conditions were excluded. And then um, we recruited 136 of these children. Half of them were assigned to the care as usual group. So they stayed behind in the institutions. Half of them were assigned to the foster care intervention uh, and they left with their foster parents. At baseline, we also in, uh, recruited a never institutionalized group. So these children were raised with their biological families. They were matched for age and sex. So throughout the study, uh, across the years, we have seen them multiple times throughout childhood and adolescence. And at age 16, we have the first dry blood spot assessment. So we collected traditional indices like blood pressure and body mass index, as well as pro-inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and some cytokines that are linked to cardiovascular disease. Here is how the talk is organized. It'll be in two parts. The first part includes one study on the effect of early psychosocial deprivation on these health outcomes. And then the second part will go into the risk factors that might modify these associations. The three things we want to test are laid out here. The first one is the effect of early institutionalization on cardiometabolic and immune functioning at age 16. The second thing we want to test is the foster care intervention effect, whether it can remediate some of those negative outcomes. And then the third thing we want to test is risk and resilience factors. 
So in the first study, we tested the biological embedding model. This model suggests that um, stress experienced in the first few years of life would become embedded in the body. And it can show up as maladaptive stress response or dampened immune functioning. And there's some support for this model. Uh, various forms of childhood adversities have been associated with things like chronic low-grade inflammation um, and other indices like being overweight. But in the adolescent literature, the findings are more mixed. Um, in our sample, we expected that they would have, the carers usual group would have higher levels of inflammation and cardiometabolic risk, whereas the foster care group would be more protected against these outcomes. The results though show there were no group differences on any of the measures that we looked at. Um, so here are some box plots, for example, showing you body mass index and two of the most commonly studied pro-inflammatory markers, including C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. So briefly, we were unable to find a direct effect of early institutionalization and we didn't find a foster care intervention effect. There are some reasons that could account for these null differences, which might be due to methodology. Um, we used blood drops instead of blood draw and the estimates might not be as precise. The participants might be too young, so these effects might show up when they age into adulthood. Um, and also not all children exposed to early deprivation will be at risk. So we ex continue to examine other risk factors using alternative models. In the second study, we looked at the stress sensitization model. We addressed two questions. The first is whether institutional rearing was sensitized individuals to cardiometabolic risk after they are exposed to additional stressful life events. And the second is whether foster care would play a protective role. So the early stress sensitization hypothesis suggests that exposure to childhood adversity would lower your threshold for handling future stressful events such that it could trigger the onset of psychopathology or other underlying vulnerabilities. This means that children who are raised in institutions should show higher risk after they're exposed to later stressors. And support for this model is primarily found for studies that look at psychopathology like depression. But there's also some evidence on stress physiology and inflammation in um, middle to later adulthood. But it is also important to look at adolescence because it might be a vulnerable period in which there are significant social and biological changes and the adolescents are trying to establish their independence. So in our study, we asked the participants at age 12 and 16 to report their stressful life events. Here, it shows that the care as usual group sh uh, reported more stressful events compared to the foster care and never institutionalized groups. At age 16, though, we did not find group differences. Um, in the predictive model, we accounted for both stressful events at age 12 and 16 because we wanted to account for both early adolescence and later adolescence to see whether one period might have stronger effects on inflammation later on. This is what we found. So in the CARES user group, more stressful life events at age 12 predicted elevated levels of inflammation and in interleukin-6 at age 16. Um, and, but we didn't see effects at age, uh, effects of stressful events at age 16. For the interactions in the foster care group and never institutionalized group, we didn't see any. So this suggests that family care might be effective in buffering against these risks. And overall, these effects suggest that um, it would be important to reduce stress not only in the early uh, developmental period, but also across development to optimize later health. In the third study, we examined psychopathology as a factor that might be linked to inflammation. 
Um, we addressed two questions. The first is whether institutional care might moderate the relation between the development of psychopathology and inflammation. And the second is whether foster care would play a protective role. So for a long time, it has been known that mental and physical health are connected. Um, people who have a mental disorder are also likely to have a medical disorder and vice versa. The neuroimmune network hypothesis is a bi-directional model that suggests early, uh, early stress is biologically embedded and it can amplify the crosstalk between brain networks for processing threats and executive control and the immune system to sustain maladaptive behaviors that contribute to uh, greater risk for both mental and physical illness. So it's really uh, talking about how these things cluster together. And in support for this model, uh, adolescents with a combination of child maltreatment and depression show the highest levels of inflammation compared to those with only one of these conditions. And similar results have been found in adults. For our children who have been institutionalized before, the predominant form of psychopathology is usually externalizing conditions like aggressive behaviors, substance use, and ADHD. So what we expected is that inflammation would cluster with uh, externalizing behaviors in the care as usual children. Um, and we asked the parents and teachers to report these externalizing behaviors across age 8, 12, and 16 because that's when these behaviors show up. Here is the trajectories in each group. Um, so at age 8 initially, both the care as usual and foster care group show high externalizing behaviors compared to the never institutionalized group. But across time, we do see that these behaviors would decrease in the foster care group but in the care as usual group, they remain stably high. So that slope is not different from zero. In the predictive model, we only find that within the care as usual group, high levels of externalizing behaviors at age eight, so that initial point, as well as that slope. And across these years, if they had lower decreases in these behaviors, then they would show the highest levels of inflammation at age 16 in um, C-reactive protein. Um, again, we didn't see these interaction effects in the foster care or never institutionalized children. So this suggests that family care might buffer against risk for both a coupling between the psychopathology and inflammation. In conclusion, our results suggest that the relation between early institutionalization and inflammation is modified by risk factors. Uh, like stressors and also resilience factors like early foster care intervention, which can change their adverse trajectories. From um, a de development perspective, this work highlights processes that uh, become more prominent in adolescents like stressors and psychopathology, and also highlights the application of a life course perspective to understand the health trajectories. Instead of looking at only early adversity, limited childhood, we look at uh, different stages to account for these uh, trajectories. The findings also inform clinical practice and social policy on how and when to intervene. Um, finally, because elevated levels of inflammation might be a pathway to uh, the development to cardiovascular disease, then it would be important to follow up on these children as they age into adulthood. So right now at age 22, we are collecting more data on these, uh, uh, these adults. So we're looking at their mental and physical health again, and I'm also uh, collecting some biological aging indices to look at this accelerated aging pathway that might be related to their later outcomes. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, this is it.